Hello, guys. Welcome to a live pop culture episode on Deprogram with Carrie Smith and Mystery Chris. How are you, Mystery Chris? I'm tired. I've been working for the man. After I watch all these movies all the weekend, these black exploitation movies, I have finally learned what I need to do. Like, man. Are you wearing are you wearing a pimp outfit behind uh, your avatar? It's at the uh, dry cleaner, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> I actually forgot until right before we started. I told you this, but I'll tell everyone else. I actually have a pimp costume. I forgot about it. I could have worn it. <laughs> You're <laughs> mad, am <laughs> pimp. <laughs> it's a lime green suit with a matching lime green hat, and I think it's I can't remember. It's a yellow shirt, and then I have a gold cane. It's a costume from a movie that we made, a short film called Thugs the Musical. It was David Allen Greer's his character's costume. I have that. Wow. So, I could have put that on, but instead I just went with my interpretation. If I were Cleopatra Jones, what would my outfit look like? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little different. Yeah, I like the hat. I haven't seen that one before. Thank you. This is a this is a good Sunday hat. Nice texture. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Pirate Tomsky. Hello, Pirate. Pirate's here with us tonight. You guys give it up for our mods. He says, I'm disappointed that Mystery Chris did not pimp his profile picture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to make it like themed for every show. Yeah, you should. Have fun with it each time. <laughs> so tonight, we are going to be talking about black exploitation films, um, which is going to be a lot of fun. Before we do that, I have something I wanted to tell you that I was doing today. Um, let me go in here into the music clips. Here we go. Can you guys hear that? I can hear it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I <couldn't tell. laughs> I'm, uh, I was cutting an ad. I'm doing my first ever ad. I was cutting an ad today for the church on the square and I found that <laughs> organ music. <laughs> <laughs> Black to pop up. <laughs> it is like Black <laughs> Anyway, I thought, it, I thought it was funny. I didn't get it finished edited in time, but I'll just tell you guys, I'm doing an ad for my church. You can find them online if you're interested at Church on the Square, thechurchonthesquare.org. And they're also on YouTube at Church on the Square. And they used to be able to do Facebook ads. That's how I originally found them. But they can't do that anymore because Facebook has said that they violated community standards. I don't know how, probably because of... Maybe it was the sermon about uh, how the church, is, the church failed during the pandemic. I don't know. <laughs> but um, anyway, I was working on this ad. I didn't finish it, but it should be pretty funny. And, and before anybody says anything, look, this is YouTube. You guys sit through ads for um, Bitcoin and porn sites and, and coffee. Everybody's doing coffee and what else? Uh, there, I saw one ad for Buy a Castle in Scotland. So, and I think you could hear a church ad, <laughs> right? I think it's okay. Are you just laughing? I want to see this ad. Yeah, it's kind of funny. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But um, somebody says they're getting ads for a cleaning service. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So how about you set it up what we're doing tonight? Uh, we're talking about black exploitation films, the 1970s and a little afterwards, but kind of exploring that and talking about the fun and good things about it, talking about some of the pushback, because believe it or not, it was controversial then, and we're just going to have some fun. Did you, when did you first see black exploitation films? The moment I was born, Carrie. That's a requirement. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I did have to watch The Wiz. I don't know that necessarily counts as black exploitation, but yeah, this is a black film. It's like required viewing for, for all black children. Uh, but growing up, I, I saw some black exploitation stuff. I mean, a lot of them were rated R, had a lot of nudity and stuff. And so I saw more of this stuff that came afterwards. 
like I'm gonna get you sucker. And, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, the last dragon. I count that as a black exploitation kind of '80s version of it. And of course, eventually Jackie Brown and um, you know uh, Undercover do you, Brother. Do you count Jackie Brown? I don't. I haven't seen it in like a couple decades. Mm -hmm. Or I had to see. I need to see it again. See if I'd actually classify it as it as a black exploitation film. But it's it's been years since I've seen. Mm -hmm. I think because it had Pam Greer mm -hmm. and because Quentin Tarantino is such a fan of black exploitation as well as other genres of film, he's just a film fan. But I think because it had Pam Greer and it was called Jackie Brown and she had been in Foxy Brown and it was just right. sort of like, oh, this is Quentin Tarantino's version of black exploitation. But as we're going to see tonight, the things that char that characterize a black exploitation film, I don't know if it met all of those. Yeah. So. Yeah. Unless the only qualification is having Pam Greer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I> might be. <laughs> yeah. So why don't we start off with if people haven't seen these? Oh, well, I'll I'll answer my own question. I I started watching these in college. I worked at a video store and watched a lot of movies and went through a whole black exploitation phase. I owned several of them on VHS, which is how old. I am. And uh, I like the ones with the female leads. Uh, so I, I didn't watch a lot of the ones that you reviewed for tonight's show. I watched Coffee with Pam Greer, Foxy Brown with Pam Greer, which is basically the same movie <laughs> but with a different character. Uh, Cleopatra Jones. A lot of them are pretty similar. So those are the ones that, that I'm prepared to show clips from so, so what drew you like what made you so excited about those particular movies they seem like they've been favorites of yours for a while now i liked them because well i was a budding feminist i was in you know i was in college i was mm -hmm. taking i was a women's studies minor i just want to say real quick you guys comedian gino visconti is here hello gino thanks for popping in we're doing black exploitation films C can you tell from my black exploitation outfit <laughs> not enough blackface carry <laughs> yeah well i liked them because they were strong female characters i know a lot of people who are anti-woke are going to hate hearing that but it's actually it it, it is anti-woke because woke is telling us right now that there were never any female leads that there were never any black leads that that they're breaking all these this ground now by forcing woke on us and that's not even true like this whole genre of films was, it was just organic to the seventies. It was organic at the time. It wasn't, it wasn't trying to force an ideology down your, your throat. It was just trying to entertain you. And so it was, yes, they were strong female leads. Um, but it wasn't in this sort of, like they didn't go out and do press for it saying, you know, we're breaking all these barriers and it, it wasn't, it, it weren't taking old properties and then, putting black women in the roles they were coming up with these new films and this new entirely new genre so it wasn't really woke yeah and that's something i think that's interesting about uh, that time because in doing research for this show i found some articles by the naacp and other civil rights groups that you know, didn't like uh, black exploitation. In fact, the the term black exploitation was coined by the head of the naacp in 1972 obviously to do, you know, mean a negative uh, that these films were promoting what they, you know, considered stereotypes of, of blacks. And so it's interesting kind of listening to them and then listening to some of the actors that betray, that were in these uh, films like uh, Pam Greer and Jim Grant Brown and a bunch of other ones who were uh, advocating for the films and saying that, you know, this is more of a accurate reflection of what blacks are in terms of more lower or working class uh, type blacks. And that not only did it feature a number of blacks on screen, but there are a lot of blacks that were working behind the scenes. And so they mm -hmm. considered it, you know, progress. And I, I kind of see both sides of that argument, but I always thought it was interesting considering like how soon these movies came about, like right after the civil rights movement yeah. kind of ended because Martin Luther King, assassinated in 68 and then the first black exploitation film was 1971 and then really 1972 is when it started to get big i believe shaft came out in 72 
but you just had an explosion of all these movies, and particularly these movies that had white, or excuse me, black protagonists that were fighting white people, racist white people, because that's that's like the one thing that <laughs> drew across the board of all the movies. They have racist white people that drop in bombs. <laughs> like every scene just to let it remind you how racist they are yeah and they call they use not just in bombs like every antiquated racist slur for black people that that our generation has forgotten mm. like there were words in there i was like what why is calling her that <laughs> oh that oh that means black you know it's like <laughs> <laughs> uh, well the other thing they were fighting though in a lot of these films i'm sure we're going to talk about this but it wasn't just racist white people. They were fighting a lot of the, the um, what would you say, the ills, the societal ills that were plaguing the black community. So yeah. in a lot of the films you had, you know, Cleopatra Jones was sort of this James Bond, this black female James Bond kind of super secret spy. And she was fighting, yes, a racist white woman played by Shelley Winters, <laughs> but she was also a drug kingpin. And the opening of the movie is Cleopatra Jones is like taking out a poppy field to destroy all the drugs, right? So that so that it doesn't devastate the black community. You, the same thing with the Pam Greer movies, Coffee, Foxy Brown, and both of those. She wasn't a spy. She was more like a, um, she was just out for revenge. She was a renegade. Okay. But she was taking revenge against who? Pimps? Drug dealers? It was it was always kind of attacking these these societal ills that were mm -hmm. that were plaguing the community yeah it, and it, you know looking at these films like they were pretty cynical because it was simply saying that the police uh the you know justice system that you know these uh institutions were all corrupt and they by extension made pimps and drug dealers seem more moral compared to the crooked politicians and the judges and everybody uh, I, was, I think it was because I watched Foxy Brown or was it Coffee? I, it was Coffee, but um, I just forgot the point I was going to make. But it, yeah, th these movies, they, they featured a lot of institutional corruption. And I always thought that was interesting, too, particularly for that time. And that seems like something that, you know, uh, I think a lot of people now would really, you know, it would appeal to a lot of people, you know, because yeah. I'm not. I kind of share some of the cynicism now <laughs> the last couple of years, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it yeah, was they did not believe there. in the institutions and we, I don't think many people believe in the institutions today. Mm -hmm. uh, today's been a big day for, for that, for me. So, um, okay. Should I put this up on screen? Uh, I don't even know what it is, but do it. Done. Okay, for anyone who didn't watch these movies, we're just going to give a brief overview. What is black exploitation? An American film movement explained, and this is an article from Studio Binder. So, black exploitation refers to a genre, a film movement, and an important period of cinema history. And this post will define black exploitation, et cetera, et cetera. They tell you what they're doing. Okay, the term black exploitation could sound like a negative label if you've never heard of it before. But the term, the term is predominantly used with love and admiration for the film movement of the 1970s, though there are some detractors. If you encounter any other unfamiliar terms, oh, I don't want to read that. <laughs> okay, here we go. Black exploitation refers primarily to a wave of independently produced genre films of the early 1970s. The name is a portmanteau of black and exploitation. Black exploitation films were produced independently and typically with extremely low budgets. Black exploitation films were predominantly made by black crews for black audiences, though more widespread appeal around the world was found. Crime, sex, drugs, and racial tensions were common subjects for black exploitation movies. Um, under the black exploitation umbrella, all major genres of film can be found, from action to horror to musical. Um, okay, and then they go through some of the historical context uh, and about how it relates to grindhouse films. So, so black exploitation, the movement was born as a genre within the broader grindhouse film era. Grindhouses were theaters that played films that other more respectable theaters would not play often featuring exploitation films and sometimes pornography as grindhouses grew more popular, especially in large cities like New York city, the number of grindhouse subgenres ballooned to unmanageable sizes 
Grindhouse films were often shot fast and cheap, and the level of quality fluctuated greatly from production to production. Um, we don't have to go through the rest. I think we can we can hit some of the the points that this article makes just by showing like different clips. So there's your background on what it was. But you said even though it says you know the the term is used with love and admiration, that's not where it originated. Mm -mm. No, yeah, NAACP, and I have an article I found from uh, 1972 in the New York Times article I sent you um, that it's by uh, NAACP where they go through everything, you know, all the problems they had with uh, these movies. And uh, to me, it, it's one of the things interesting is that if you look at what was uh, also going on in the 70s, you had a lot of the gangster films that were getting more popular with, you know, Italian mobsters and those feature very similar, you know, characters in terms of having these anti-heroes, these heroes that weren't really motivated by um, more of virtuous cause, or they had means that weren't, um, out, they, they operated outside the law and, and went to the extremes and, and you know, were judge, jury, and executioner when it came to the vigilante stuff. And so I always thought that was interesting about the 70s in general, where it seemed like we saw the rise of the anti-heroes. And I, mm -hmm. I imagine that a lot of that was influenced by where America was in the 1960s and how a lot of people became more disillusioned with, you know, America and the American dream with the civil rights stuff, with the Vietnam War and eventually Watergate, where a lot of people started questioning, you know, the moral identity of America and our system. And I think that got reflected in a lot of the movies and television of the time. And I think black exploitation definitely reflected a lot of that. Well, do you want to read some of this New York Times article that you sent me? Sure. Uh, so I think this is from the president in AACP. At present, black movies are a ripoff, enriching major white film producers and a very few black people. These films are taking our money while feeding us a forced diet of violence, murder, drugs, and rape. Some films are the cancer of black exploitation, gnawing away at the moral fiber of our community. Some attempt to justify the portrayals of pimps, prostitutes, dope pushers, and super studs. But the constant bombardment of those images on the minds of our children is a theft far from damaging than economic loss. Images projected on film shape the values, the expectations, and the opinions of the viewers. It would be much too naive to believe that some films are not message films. All films are molding the thoughts and actions of young and old, men and women, black and white. Imagery expressed in film forms the minds of the people in terms of what we think of ourselves and what others think of us. Scrolling down. Uh, if black movies do not contribute to building constructive, healthy images of black people and to fairly recording the black experience, we shall have lost our money and our souls. We shall have contributed to our own cultural genocide by only offering our children the models of degeneration, degradation, destruction, and dope. Recently, however, many of us unconcerned with black movies, particularly black talent, met at Chicago's Push Expo. We came together knowing that black exploitation must stop immediately. We agree that such exploitation in films must be rooted out now, just as other forms of segregation and racism are being rooted out in our society. Only recently, the movie industry discovered that even the nation's poorest economic group, Black people, makes the difference between profit and loss. At the same time, Black people were learning that we are poor economically, yet our collective economic power can determine the future of major industries such as the movie industry. How do you mute it? I was saying, here's the thing, though, as you pointed out, these films were actually produced by a lot of black people. There were a lot of black people behind the camera, not just on the camera. And so and, and it was sort of made by black people for black people primarily. So why was the NAACP so upset? <laughs> like, you know, I've, I've heard some people talk about how the differences between what black is differs between, say, lower class working class blacks and like middle class blacks and middle class blacks are more high-minded and maybe want a more uh positive portrayal of blacks and maybe lower classes don't mind the more gritty stuff and we kind of see that reflected in you know modern day hip-hop culture um if you remember i don't maybe we didn't talk about this on a previous episode but when we're talking about the cosby show how 
there were some people that loved that it was a positive portrayal of a black family, a middle class, upper middle class family that you know was intact, and the father and mother had really good, high paying jobs, and the kids were good kids. But there were also people who were complaining that saying that this wasn't an accurate representation of what blacks are in black culture, and they're upset that uh, the Cosby Show didn't deal with any kind of social topics. And to me, it's like, why? does everything with black people have to address any kind of these social topics? Why can't some of these things just be entertainment? But with black exploitation movies, given the vast majority of them, I can kind of see where people come from in terms of saying that these characters are very stereotypish, you know, when there's similar characters being pimps and drug dealers and uh, people, like I said, anti-hero types. And so I can, I can kind of see that, um, but I can also see the, I hate using this term empowerment, but I can kind of see that given, you know, the times that, you know, these movies came out and right after, you know, civil rights, you know, era and after tremendous violence and all these things going on, particularly in the South. Uh, Pirate has a question for you. He says, could you argue that even back in the seventies, the NAACP didn't want equal rights. They just wanted reparations and thus set society on this course. I don't know. I'm just asking. I I guess yeah I, I mean I've never really cared that much about the NAACP. I mean, uh, reading what? up there and like reading about some of the stuff there, it just seems like it's got kind of corrupt. So. You mean you're you're a card carrying member of the Star Trek Enterprise Society? What's it called? The what? But you you have a Star Trek card, but you don't have an NAACP card. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I they never mailed it to me. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a 2022 for you. I think I was a member of the NAACP. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rachel Dolezal. Tell me more. <laughs> Back when I was woke, I donated to lots of people, I had lots of cards. Okay. Anyway, let's see. Um, we did have a super chat. Oh, it's also from, hey, thank you, Pirate. Gave us a super chat of 10 pounds. He says, if you don't play the Shaft theme tune, we riot. Oh, we're going to play it. And that's one of the other great things about these Black Exploitation films is the soundtracks. You know, if Isaac Hayes doing Shaft, Curtis Mayfield doing Super Pimp, or Super Fly, excuse me. Let's just call it Super Pimp. I like that better. Pimp. But yeah, they had a really fantastic, you know, soul kind of funk music in a lot of these movies. And I think that also helped kind of get out you know, more black music to wider audiences. Yeah, it's um, the way that they're put together. I mean, I mean, this is true for any great film, no matter the genre is is when the music is matched so well with the with the movie. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of these films, it's just that perfect. You did that like you just associate it. You hear that and you're like, <laughs> And then you see Pam Greer. <laughs> There's a black exploitation. I, I can't even say the name, but it's Boss N Word. Mm -hmm. it says it, and it has one of the greatest songs I've ever heard. It just repeats the N word over and over. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. It's so catchy. It's still in my head. <laughs> Should we intersperse some of these articles with clips? Yeah. Can, Can we play? We'll let's play just play clip. the Shaft one to start. Okay. Should we do that? The trailer. Uh, play a trailer. Yeah. Okay. We'll do that. Hey, I was just wondering while you're reading that New York Times piece, why was there never a Hicksploitation genre of film about my people? Kind of. Is Deliverance. Uh, and that's true. This kind of movies. I actually kind of want to do a future episode of Pop Culture where we talk about like the portrayals of the South in movies. That'd be interesting. I would love that. Hicksploitation. That's what we'll call it. That episode. <laughs> okay. Get out of the way. That's how you gonna be here. You should be here. Open it up. Shaft's his name. Shaft's his game. That's how you gonna be here. And he ain't. <laughs> <laughs> I love these movies. Right. Five minutes and then a sex scene. What? And in all these movies, it's like five minutes and then a the sex scene. <laughs> It'll take long. And now time for 
some romantic lighting. <laughs> Wait. That's some cold shit. <laughs> Throwing my man Leroy out the window. Pick my man up and threw him out the goddamn window. Listen, Snow White. Me and you gonna tangle sooner or later. Why don't you stop playing with yourself, Willie? You ain't gonna do shit. Shaft's his name. Shaft's his game. Hey, man, I don't know no Ben Buford. Funny. Oh, that Ben Buford. We're gonna take it out of your ass, Pip. <laughs> Here we go. It should have just started with the punch. Yeah, this is a nigga named John Shaft. Just found him. Wow. The mob wanted Harlem back. They got Shaft up to here. All I'm asking you is to let me know what's going on. No names, no places, just what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tom, you took your minute. Get out. Why are you laughing? <laughs> this is back in a time when the police officer, like the head chief police officer, was white. Like now they're all black. Mm. Like, you ever see the last action hero where they're making fun of that trope, like the angry black police chief? I did not see that one. Nah, but I saw not worth it, but uh so I married an axe murderer with what's his name from Siren Live from Wayne's World. Mike, Mike Myers. Myers. And there's a scene in there where his, his friend in the movie is a cop and he's always going into the office and he wants, he wants his boss to be like the, all these movie versions of bosses where they're like, I need you to get me, you know, just like yelling. <laughs> and his boss is not like that. He's like, well, whenever you think you have time to investigate that. <laughs> I always like the Simpsons one. Uh, where I think it was uh, what was it, the um, McBain movie, and the, like the chief is like, "You're off your case, McGardigal." And he's like, "No, chief, you're off your case." And he's like, "What does that mean exactly?" Homer goes, "It means you're a stupid chief, chief." <laughs> That's the total. It's a complete, uh, just a stereotype of the the, yeah. yeah. And have you seen So I Married an Axe Murderer? No, never actually seen that. I know. We Shock. have to find a theme one night so I can talk about that movie. Not tonight. Yeah. Okay. We'll keep going. Tommy, man. Wait a gun. God Come on, in front of me. <laughs> what a super heavy block number. I'm gonna play. Mine. I mean, we can nail your tail for manslaughter on what we got on you right now. Right on. <laughs> what is it? When you lead a revolution, why did better be standing still? But you don't run with a down no more. We're done running, man. Like the whole movie. The whole movie. It's not a great trailer. Shaft. Hotter than Bond, cooler than Bullet. Rated R. If you want to see Shaft, ask your mama. <laughs> ask your mama. <laughs> so I, I, go ahead. No, you go. Oh, I just watched uh, Shaft this weekend. I think I may have seen it when I was real young, but seen forever so i watched this past weekend because i watched a bunch of movies in preparation for this episode and i liked chef and i felt like it was the one that's closest to a more film nor almost you know a you know detective that's being hired to find a missing girl and um i thought it's interesting that it was like the only movie of the ones i watched in which the black gangsters were more like um old school rah, kind of gangsters instead mm -hmm. of like <laughs> modern you know ghetto gangsters so i was like uh this is like a weird transitional period i guess before it just kind of devolved more into you know more stereotype type of gang members and gang leaders 
you say it's more film noir. What do you mean by that? I mean, like in terms of the story for a lot of those film noir movies in terms, mm -hmm. of, you know, a uh, detective who's being hired to, to go on some mission to do something. It doesn't have a femme fatale or anything in that, so it's not film noir. I'm not saying it's film noir, but right. kind of like closest to to that kind of genre of all the black exploitation movies I've seen. Right. The other thing is, when you're looking at this now, especially if you've never watched these films, it's like, oh, that's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of violence, and you know, it. That's what grindhouse films were like, though. It wasn't just black exploitation, and and as we mentioned in the beginning, this grew out of the grindhouse film. So it makes sense. This was something that was happening overall culturally at that time in the seventies. Yeah. To see all this on screen. Yeah. And yeah, definitely like definitely um, audience seeing things that had seen before. Like, you know, when I was talking, when we did the zombie episode, I was talking about how night and living dead kind of broke a lot of rules that uh, were in place for movies and stuff in terms of like nudity and uh, the violence and a black man slapping a white woman. Uh, and so, like these movies, like like I'm saying early, just right after you know the '60s, it's just interesting just how quickly these grew and how popular they became with you know, more mass audience, despite uh, the pushback. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to go to an article now, or can I show a clip from? Uh, keep it. The, keep going to the clip. Okay, let's watch. Actually. We can watch, let's watch the Cleopatra Jones trailer. And then if it doesn't include this one scene, I'm going to show you a clip from the movie also. Okay. Here we go. Mm -hmm. So Cleopatra Jones was 1973. Can you see that? Mm, let's there see. Yeah, there we go. Look at her outfit, guys. If I ever hear you sound so much as a cough, <laughs> and you're so hard. Tamara Duff's The Soul Sisters Answer to James Bond and the most exciting new star in years. Six feet two of dynamite and it's all stacked. I told you where and I told you when and I told you how to get that. Cleopatra Jones. She is sticking her nose in my business. Shelly Winters is amazing in this. <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah, playing playing the uh, evil drug kingpin evil. white person. Yeah. And up against her is the arch enemy, the female successor to Goldfinger, two-time Academy Award winner Shelley Winters as Mommy. <laughs> that down before I make you eat it. Well, I don't want this town to blow up. <laughs> Big deal. Hang it right there. Right on, sweet sister. Man, <laughs> ten miles. Right on, sweet sister. <laughs> I don't know if you saw, but even one of the white guys had an afro a little bit, a few seconds ago. <laughs> yeah. Firm dessert. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Here we go. You are no match for that black lady. I'll take care of Cleopatra Jones. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, they're Leo showing Hacker the whole Jones, movie. Starring Tom Rodolph, <laughs> co-starring <laughs> Bernie Casey, Brenda Sykes, Esther Rowe, and Shelley Winters as Bonnie. Okay. This. Hold on. I'm going to stop right there because I actually want to show you that clip they were about to do separately. Just, just bear with me. Watch this. So we talked about the music being so iconic in these films. The other thing was the fashion. I mean, every outfit that Cleopatra Jones wears is just, it's gorgeous. She's got big earrings. She's wearing um, all of her hair hidden with a bandana or she's wearing hats or she's got furs on. And when you first see her, the movie starts, uh, let's see, Ed. Add to stream. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So the movie starts and this helicopter lands at this big poppy field. And just watch how she gets out of the helicopter and the way they first introduced her on screen. Look at all those raccoon tails. <laughs> <laughs> Also, it's hot there. It's hot, but she's not about to sacrifice fashion. She has a whole, probably two raccoons wrapped around her head. Yeah, good cost. It's gorgeous. I love this hat. Your love turned darkness to light. Woman, your love is warm and strong. I'm gonna love you from now on. You move like the okay, that's enough. I mean, her whole outfit's amazing, but so I, I watched uh, for this weekend. Uh, I didn't watch Cleopatra Jones, but I did watch Foxy Brown and Coffee, oh. uh, Fly Shaft, Dolomite, and a little bit of a movie called Jive Turkey, which is disappointing. You think a movie called Jive Turkey would be interesting, but it's kind of boring, so I stopped watching it. But it was interesting because Shaft and Coffee were a little bit more serious, I guess, because a, a lot of these movies became more, some of them were, were straight on camp, but other ones, even though if maybe they didn't quite intend it to be as unintentionally funny or, or, or intentionally funny, they still kind of came off that way. And so it's interesting looking at how the movies, you know, based on what I could tell, start a little bit more serious and then just kind of embrace like the wacky action and and over top violence and in addition to that it's also interesting considering how while some of these movies were you know tapping into the james bond type uh, genre spy genre they even talk about it in the last two trailers we watched james bond at the time was inspired by black exploitation live and let die which was pretty much a black exploitation movie, but with you know 007, they actually had um, the the uh, I think the first black Bond girl. I think she was in some other some legitimately black exploitation movies. But it's interesting seeing how both of these you know genres were kind of influenced one another. You know, black exploitation more from the spy stuff with Bond, but it's interesting. Yeah, the coffee is coffee or foxy brown which is the one where she um which is the one where she lets people live at the end and tells them she wants them to spend their whole life suffering after she shoots she castrates one guy and then she shoots the woman is that that's foxy brown i think that's foxy brown i i i liked coffee i did not like foxy brown uh, I thought there were so many scenes in the film that could have been cut out that served no purpose whatsoever it's like the scene where she gets sexually assaulted and she ends up setting a white guy on fire. Like it's only there because they want to set a white dude on fire. <laughs> <laughs> What's Cut wrong that with that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying there needs to be more of it. The whole movie should just consist of There's also the scenes are a little bit like extra. Like so at, at one point after she castrates this guy, this is in Foxy Brown, and she takes the she takes his genitals in a jar to to, yeah, that's fine. To yeah. And it just takes a while for her to actually get the bag that hadn't opened the bag and <laughs> get the jar. And you're like, this whole scene could have been condensed. 
<laughs> and also when she like she goes in um and and threatens her brother i think it is mm-hmm. and she and she trashes his room after it's just kind of added like after she shoots at him and everything and and gets what she needs then she's then she just starts like knocking over all of his furniture <laughs> <laughs> It's just added. And yeah. He's like, what are you doing? He's on the floor like, what? I bought that at Ikea. No, I'm kidding. She yeah. picks up she picks up like a table and tosses it, a chair, and it, you're just like, why Why did they put this in here? That's one of the things I loved about Dolomite, because Dolomite's like, it, it's campy. It's intentionally bad, but they had so many unnecessary shots. <laughs> like they should, And I actually have a clip maybe show later uh, demonstrating uh, just how bad the film is, but uh, I, I love the the more goofy uh, black exploitation stuff, like you know, with uh, Rudy Ray Moore movies. Why don't I show the Dolomite clip now? Oh yeah, let's do it. Okay. Which I still need to watch the uh, biopic of him that Eddie Murphy did on. I think it's a Netflix film. I don't know if it's okay. any good or not. Reading the reviews, but it looked interesting. I don't know if Eddie Murphy still has it or not, but. Okay, so set this up. What are we watching? Oh, so this is a clip from t- the beginning of uh, Dolomite, and it's self-explanatory. Stuff. Get behind the trees. What do you want, man? FBI. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> the There's nothing in my trunk. Where's your warrant at? It's the FBI. This is my search warrant. <laughs> Where do they get these actors? Seven <laughs> Eleven. <laughs> okay. There's nothing in my trunk, man. Open up the trunk. That shit ain't mine. I don't know how it got there. You're under arrest. You're going to have to take me. <laughs> <laughs> That guy just comes out of the frame with like a <laughs> gun first, like <laughs> great. Episode. Everything and again, these were low budget films <laughs> reflected in the quality. <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> 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 One more move and you're dead. <laughs> That's great. Thank uh, you. Great, great movies. Yeah, I did that. Uh, Human Tornado, uh, uh, Disco Godfather, PD Wheat Straw. Which I've seen Disco Godfather and Human Tornado. Those are wow. also hilarious. They're all the same movies. Wow. You, you did a lot of homework. Pirate Tomsky says... Uh, Hey, Carrie, is this from one of those CRT videos we watched a few months ago? Uh, no kidding. You, it doesn't. you remember which ones we're talking about? Yeah, I think I saw some on uh, Friday Night Tights. I think they showed yeah. some. They were pretty, pretty crazy. There was one with a white woman who was at a basketball, uh, an outside basketball court just with a whip waiting for black people to show up and play basketball so she could whip them. It was, it was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> the acting was about like that. But I, I remember people were trying to figure out whether it was tongue in cheek. Oh, the acting? They, like the whole concept. Like, do you think these people were serious or they're doing it like as a joke? Oh, ba- you mean that those CRT films? Yeah. I think they were created. I think originally there were, there's, there are channels that I didn't know this at the time, but there are channels that just put out ridiculous 
ridiculous over the top stuff like that so they can have a title that says like racist white woman whips um black youth at the basketball court so that they get clicks and but then i heard it was used here's the danger once you create something no matter what niche you're doing it for that it was used in some crt trainings (laughs) (laughs) regardless of where it came from so well it's kind of like the um uh movie karen did you watch the karen i don't know anybody watched it like i remember when the trailer came out people were making big deal of it people make fun of it everything and then movie came out i didn't hear anybody talk about it which made me think like maybe this movie was tongue-in-cheek from start and maybe that's why people don't bother talking about it like oh they're in on a joke i don't know i didn't watch it we should watch it one night yeah (laughs) you and i should do a special like locals hang out where everybody can come and watch it with us we can't put yeah. it on YouTube to watch the whole thing, but we should do that. That would be fun. I have not seen it. I saw the trailer, just like you said. I was one of the people that laughed at the trailer and never watched it. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, we should do that. Uh, we do have another super chat from Ever Jance. Thank you, sir. He says, I love you, Carrie and Chris. I love the topic, and I hope that a certain infamous black exploitation Western at least gets an honorable mention. Boston. Which you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> uh boss inward oh oh somebody posted that trailer on my uh, on my facebook i think that I one i haven't seen i want to watch it i has the inward a lot so if you're cool with that <laughs> <laughs> can we show do you think we could get away with showing the the trailer the, it's in the trailer the, the, the music plays in the trailer where he says do you think they would ban our channel if we play it? Uh, well, can I say I'm black and I approve of this message? <laughs> can I do that? Does that work? I don't know the rules. I'll cue it up just in case. We'll see. <laughs> Go put it in the chamber. Put it in the chamber. <clears throat> okay. Did you want to look at this other article about black exploitation be- being <laughs> exploitation? Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember which one that was. I think that was the uh, we can. It was a pretty long article, and be, be honest, I didn't fully finish it, but not that it was bad. I just I was running out of well, time. I want to but... see what they have to say. This is from 1972, also. Um, and this was in the Harvard Crimson. The headline is Black Movies A New Wave of Exploitation. On the verge of closing for lack of attendance, Central City Theaters are currently doing a booming business with, quote, black movies. A new... (laughs) You can tell, I think a white person wrote this. (laughs) (laughs) Good one. (laughs) A new genre of films featuring blacks in leading roles. How dare they? (laughs) They are often, but not always, written and directed by blacks. Again, this white guy has a problem with that. Most of the films have set box office records, and though Hollywood is straining itself to churn out the product, the black audience's appetite appears to go unsatisfied. But what appears to be a breakthrough for a people previously excluded from this important medium is instead another cruel hoax played on the black community. Blacks have been led into the movies, but only in roles that perpetuate derogatory stereotypes or create counterproductive myths. Come on, man. This was part of a whole genre, Grindhouse Films, that that was not black. This is a black subgenre of Grindhouse. Like they're talking about this as if this as if this just emerged from nowhere, and that it that there weren't films with white people as well that were like this. And that's one of the points that Fred Williamson made, one of the guys who starred in uh, black exploitation films, about how uh, a big deal wasn't being made of you know films with white people. Where they're very similar movies, essentially. No one's saying, oh, this is bad. And not to the degree they were saying black exploitation was bad. Yeah. There's this sort of a, there's something that happens that I've noticed where different, different races, I guess, are held to a different standard or criticized in different ways. Not that white people aren't criticized. White people are criticized all the time (laughs) in film lately, but the way in which, black people or Asian people were criticized in film is sometimes different. Like I remember seeing um, better off dead. Do you know that movie? Yeah, I know. I've never seen it, but yeah. I know. So 
it was when it was like making the festival rounds and this was a uh, oh not better off dead sorry it's um it, it, the name of it was a takeoff uh, of better off dead i'm trying to remember it was an all asian cast and uh, if somebody knows in the chat this is a it, perry chan is in it um anyway it's an all asian cast it's about these asian kids who create a cheating ring at their high school and it gets very dark and there ends up being murder in it it's this dark kind of drama and it was a great movie. And then when they did the festival circuit, they actually had Asian people in the audience, older Asian people who did not like the movie, who were standing up and saying stuff like, you know, I don't think you should be portraying our community as, as murderers and cheaters and, and, and really ho and, and holding them to a different standard because, because it was an all Asian cast and a lot of Asian people behind the scenes. And, I thought I saw one of the Q and A's where some of the actors were on stage and they had a great point. They were like, it it's, you, you would never say that you would never look at a film like the good son with Macaulay Culkin, where he's this evil kid who kills people. You never look at that and say, Oh, you're portraying white people in a bad light. So why would you do that to an Asian film? Like, right. Well, it was similar to, uh, you remember the live in color episode we did where uh, Spike Lee didn't like that. Keenan Ivan Waynes and the other Waynes brothers were making fun of black people, particularly when they did the Homeboy Shopping Network. And Keenan Ivan Waynes was like, I, does, I, it doesn't really matter. Or I, he said he doesn't really care to make any kind of social or political statement. He just wants things to be funny. That was the main thing. And then they made fun of everyone. And in fact, actually, maybe I'll, I'll post this on my Twitter, but I found a uh, Donahue episode where he, he had the cast of a limb color on there. This is like from 1990. And they get into it with Donahue, which I, I don't know if Donahue was playing Delve's advocate or if he was, you know, actually saying what he believed, but they were all defending, you know, the, their decisions and to, to make fun of everyone or to do the men on film thing where they're making fun of, you know, fanboy gay guys. And it got kind of heated, but it was really interesting uh, seeing them, you know, kind of fight for that and saying the things that we've been saying. And I wish more people continue to say, that you know, there's the difference between you know, making fun of someone uh, in terms of you know putting them down because of you know the race, like being mean spirited, versus someone who's just having you know fun and doing you know just kind of having a fun poke. So I think with the black exploitation stuff, it, it's it's kind of similar. Like I said, they have you know blacks that are in positions of kind of power and authority, even though they may not be coming from a more virtuous uh, position they're fighting against, you know, systemic corruption, which you would think would appeal to, you know, NAACP and a lot of others who do, you know, have been saying that these, you know, institutions, the justice institution, court system and everything is uh, corrupted in favor of, of white people. And so, you know, the whole, the whole uh, term, the man that, that yeah. came from exploitation, which was just, you know, talking about the white man saying that the white man's controlling everybody and, and pushing the black man down. So, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's just, it's sort of like a, it's never good enough. Mm -hmm. And and the criticism comes at you in different ways, I guess, depending on, like, what group you belong to. <laughs> but they're always going to hold you to some ridiculous standard of, like, you're not allowed to do this. Why? It's a bad representation. <laughs> I always like know, to I was say, I always like to ask, you know, when will it be okay then? For someone who believes that, you know, like when will it be okay uh, to to make fun of like a white comedian making fun of black people or or whatever? When when will that be okay? Yeah, is the answer for that? And I don't think people who say uh, who have a problem with it would say that there is a point because it's core to their identity. It's core to the fight. They never think of end dates of when. Okay, now oh. we can now we can do this. Um, by the way, if anyone's interested in the film I mentioned. Thank you, Gen X Slacker. He got the name for me. It's Better Luck Tomorrow. Better Luck Tomorrow. It was a 2002 film, and it's it's really good. I mean, it's a dark drama, and it's got John Cho in it and Perry Chan. I forget who else. And um, and yeah, it was it was criticized by Asian people, saying that they it portrayed Asian people in a negative light. <laughs> but anyway, it it was a great movie. Okay screen 
I did want to read just a little bit more of this piece and then let's watch another fun clip. Cool. So this is uh, what we assume is a white person lecturing the world about why black exploitation is, is a bad genre and needs to go away. So it says, um, Black community organizations from the militant core to the integrationist NAACP have called the films exploitative. Well, it's in the title. <laughs> <laughs> but their objections have not yet been heeded. Feeling a need for further action, several civil rights groups last summer announced the formation of a coalition against black exploitation and a film rating committee that will classify black movies as superior, good, and acceptable objectionable or thoroughly objectionable uh, we will not tolerate the continued warping of our children's minds with the filth violence and cultural lies that are all pervasive in current productions of so-called black movies explained junius griffin former president of the hollow branch of the NAACP and founder of the new coalition the transformation from the stereotyped step and fetch it to the super n-word on the screen is just another form of cultural genocide even with such harsh words, Griffin states the case mildly. The exploitative process affects Blacks long after they leave their local movie houses. Not only do the films promote detrimental political and value orientations, but they also plunder the Black community artistically and economically. It, here's the thing. It says, it's talking about how uh, they promote detrimental political and value orientations. But as we've talked about, a lot of these films the lead characters were anti-heroes, which means they were heroes. They were good guys. They didn't, they didn't follow the rules. They broke the rules. They would, uh, some of them would murder. They would torture. There's one where um, Pam Greer, I can't remember if it was Coffee or Foxy Brown, is like beating up an, a drug addicted woman to get information out of her, like showing no care towards her. And so they would break the rules and, but they were, it was always, for a lot of times, it was for this good purpose of taking down a drug kingpin or getting revenge for her younger sister becoming addicted to heroin. You know, they were flawed hero characters. So to say that it, it, it the values were off, I mean, <clears throat> if you look at the storylines of some of these movies, it was at least they, I would say they were, it was more clear like that there's a right and a wrong and then like an overall right and wrong. Uh, than it is in some fil films today. Does that make sense? Am I saying that right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I think with uh, a lot of those uh, films, I think uh, I, I understand, again, I kind of understand where they're coming from. Um, and I can understand it if they're in an environment in which there's nothing but those type of portrayals, but they seem to not want those portrayals at, at all. So it, like if their argument is saying, hey, we also want to see some more positive portrayals of, you know, uh, blacks being in prominent roles. Because like prior to this, the only like prominent black actor is Sidney Poitier. And he was, you know, always kind of a good guy and, and stuff. But, you know, these were a lot more darker, no pun intended, uh, portrayals of blacks. And I, I, I can again, I can coming from but still, you know, I'm not against having, you know, uh, these portrayals because. There are people like this. It's not like a, a you know goofy stereotype where you know like there's like oh we gotta get some water and some fried chicken and stuff like that. I could understand if they were doing that. This is more reflective again of like more lower class uh, blacks. A lot of lower class blacks were living like that. Now, I don't think that should become like mainstream, like the the, the only betrayals, but uh, it is you know an aspect of you know quote unquote black culture. So. Mm -hmm. One more correction about Better Luck Tomorrow, and then I'll leave this alone. I kept saying Perry Chan because I watched too much Friday Night Tights. Like, I was like, did he take his name? <laughs> I kept saying, <clears throat> Pirate corrected me. It's You're right. It's not Perry Chan. It's Perry Shan. That's the name of the, yeah. the actor. <laughs> <laughs> A rip-off name, Perry Chan. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Also, space space uh, debris says Hicks exploitation was a thing. Carrie, it was. I didn't know. I missed it. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do some research. Uh, okay. So, what clip should we show next? Um, 
Do you want to show the that clip of uh, Ron O'Neill who plays Superfly, Priest and Superfly? Uh, and we can just skip through it a little bit because it's like a ten minute clip. I'm not I'm not gonna show the whole thing, but he's defending black exploitation. And I guess James Earl Jones had a show or something because they're both there. But uh, he's a he's an articulate guy. I've been told that saying a black person's articulate is racist. <laughs> well, I'm gonna say it. That's later. something woke people say. They say yeah. they isn't that crazy? They have certain compliments you're not allowed to give a person <laughs> if they're black. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Okay, here we go. You tell me where to where to skip ahead if this isn't right. Oh, uh, I don't have a specific time. Uh, just like when they after his intro, I guess when they shows uh, Ron O'Neill sitting down. Yeah. Okay. Just play a little bit, and just you can skip around That's good, uh, right there to fly and hugh robertson who edited midnight cowboy and many other films and he's just directed his first feature film melinda there's a lot of controversy raging in black communities from new york to los angeles over the images being created uh in black films by the film industry and as a the center of part of this kind of was Iran. Uh, how do you see your role in Superfly uh, as a positive force or a negative one? Oh, wow, what a question. Well, I'll tell you, Jim, um, obviously I consider it a positive one or I never would have done the film. Um, I helped to write the film, um, my role in particular. Um, you see, when we... When we begin to discuss the criticism of black films, uh, you have this duality involved, this two-level thing. You see, you have the man in the street, his actual condition, and the way he actually lives, uh, the way we actually live in America. And then you have uh, all the things that people keep going around saying, you see. And, and when we made Superfly, we made it about the way things actually are. And we hoped it would be judged and criticized on that basis. Uh, but my, from my observation, you know, Superfly has been largely criticized from some, some you know, at some sphere, some, some plane, some plateau, you know, that has no bearing on the film. It's like, you know, it's like, um, if you're going to discuss, you know, African dance, I mean, it's like, you know, the Bolshoi, <laughs> Bolshoi ballet uh, teacher, you know, d doing a criticism mm. of uh, African dance. I mean, it's, it does not a apply. How do, you, how do you explain the, the, the popularity of Superfly in spite of the criticism that it received? I mean, the, the adverse criticism. Well, it's, it goes back to that <laughs> duality again. You see, you have the masses of people, black and white, you know, and Superfly is played to an awful lot of white people by the way. It's the only way you can do $19, $20 million. And we've been in Boston 17 weeks, and we ran out of black people in three weeks <laughs> in Boston, <laughs> you know. Um, it's the duality between what the man in the street really wants to see and what people keep saying the man in the street wants to see. Now, that's another discussion, possibly, you know, that we can get into. It's my personal opinion that the reason... Uh, there's been a, a rash of so-called black films uh, on exploitation level is because we have been basically invisible. And black people have naturally starved uh, in terms of seeing their own image in, you know, other than a stereotype role on the screen. So uh, uh, the motion picture industry, which is a business, uh, will continue to make these films until uh, the mass of black people uh, stop going to see them. You know, it's all <laughs> works in the box office. I mean, we make what you want to see. That used to be the case. <laughs> right. Yeah, a lot of people don't uh, blame the person who's, you know, uh, consuming a particular type of media. They go after people producing it. And I'm like, well, you know, that says something more about the culture and the interests of that culture. And so I think you'd want to address that than solely going after people producing things. Yeah. 
It's interesting if you think about, if you put this in today's context, what he's saying about, um, uh, what he was saying about how there's there's reality and then there's what what people want you to to want to watch, and so we're making reality, we're making what people want to see. Um, and if you think about today's context, there's so many studios and networks who, instead of making what people want to see, they're making that they're doing the opposite. They're making this sort of moralistic woke content that nobody's asking for really that the population at large is not asking for like a small vocal minority is asking for sure but they're doing that they're kind of saying like no we want you to want this and people are saying audiences are saying no like that's not what we want to see but they won't accept that like no it's because you're racist yeah. you're sexist it's like no it's just because it's a garbage show or movie Terrible characters. Yeah. Did you want to watch more of this one? I don't have to. No, that that's. I think that's good. But before, yeah. Go ahead. Be before we move on, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that I really want to watch some of these on the side. I know someone, <laughs> someone in the chat mentioned it too. This one is called "Black Folks Sell You Stuff." TV commercials yeah. in the 1970s. Yeah, actually, if you want to click on that, we could just briefly. There, I was going through that earlier. Uh, there was a Bill Cosby one in there that I thought was cool. I should have <laughs> time stamp. It's early on. I see three kids. Alpha bits. Wow. Part of a good breakfast. You're smart kid. It's me, Jackson 5. <laughs> and your alpha bits is C. I'm gonna put color on my wheels. Mine's for the handlebars. <laughs> How do they look? Beautiful. Hey, look at my great handlebars. One bike decoration in each special mark box of false alphabets. That sounds terrible. I'm Mrs. Vern. I love <laughs> working in your shop. But in the morning. Why does that sound terrible? It's just called alphabets. And look at it. Just look at it. Everything's terrible. <laughs> For a moment, I thought they were gonna. Like one of Michael Jackson's noses, like every box comes with a Michael Jackson nose. It's it's funny though to see such big stars in a serial commercial. Mm -hmm. Like at that time to have such a big I don't know what it would be it would be like like who's he I don't know what the kids are listening to. It would be like Doja Cat doing a honey nut Cheerios commercial. Right? Times <laughs> tough. Times were tough. <laughs> you have bad breath. You need to go mouthwash. First thing in the morning, and your breath will really be fresh. That's it. I'll tell her about scope. Good morning. I'm Mrs. Byrne. Oh, you use scope, too. I just try scope, and my breath feels just wonderful. From now on, it's scope in the morning. Every morning. Ah! Good girl. <laughs> He's high off a scope. <laughs> I live in a fourth-floor apartment, and this laundry room is in the basement. A little before that. Uh, a little oh, before Sanford and Sons. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, yeah, at the beginning. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Do we got you. Maybe we'll get you with the great white owl flavor or the mildness or one of the great white owl shapes like this, New Yorker. But we're going to get you. You know we're going to get you. It's only a matter of time. And then we're going to get him, White Al. We're going to get him. Right. Hi, uh, uh, so, first of all, this mustache was very creepy. In, yeah. In that. Uh, two, another thing a lot of people don't know is he helped produce uh, Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, which was the first black exploitation movie. It came out in 1971. Wait, say that again? He helped produce the first black exploitation movie. Oh, Bill Cosby did? No, I didn't know that. A movie called Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. Wow, okay. I'm just sorry. I'm I'm just sitting here kind of stunned because he looks so young, and that mustache. <laughs> it's terrifying. Looks fake, and and uh, if we were not on a show right now, this is the kind of thing I would just sit here and watch all of these. <laughs> like, 
like uh they just kind of it's a it takes you right back to a, a different time um, i mean this was before i wasn't born until 78 so but it but it kind of just transports you there whether whether you live through it or not and um i didn't realize all these big stars were in were in tv commercials like sanford and sons bill cosby it's it's kind of crazy Okay, we, we, this is not a show about black people selling us stuff, though. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, people in the chat are like, they were talking about how uh, James Earl Jones looks so young in that clip also. Yeah, and I liked how uh, you can always tell he's a theatrical actor as the way he talks as... Uh, and it, you could also tell, like, with um, uh, Darth Vader, like, that was one of the things that always angered me about uh, Hayden Christensen when they turned him to Darth Vader. It's like, he talks nothing like Darth Vader. He doesn't yeah. talk. Very theatrical, yes. Yeah. So I have another trailer here we can watch. If Do you it. want. Okay. We're going to watch the Blackula trailer, which <laughs> is about a black Dracula. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, I like movies people, like black in the title of it. I like explaining things that should be obvious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. You shall pay Black Prince. I press you with my name. You shall be Blackula. Blackula. A black Avenger. <laughs> rising from his tomb to fill the night with horror. Blackula. Dracula's soul brother. <laughs> Deadlier even than he. You know, he is a strange dude. <laughs> You're a nut that ran in front of my cab. You're the only imbecile on this street. Boy. Black Dracula. <laughs> Look at me. You'll find I mean, oh. you got to be oh. out here somewhere. I mean, oh, no. You, you take your hands off of me. I don't know you. He thirsts for your blood. He hungers for your soul. Warm young bodies will feed his hunger. Hot, fresh blood will quench his awful thirst. Did you watch this one? I didn't watch back of it. So I, I don't know a lot about this one. I haven't seen this one either. I I read about it. It said it's actually not intended to be like campy. It's actually intended to be a real horror film with yeah. a lot of thought put into it. You, you like the campy ones. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A former African prince bitten by the original Dracula stalks the streets of modern Los Angeles. Appalled by contemporary customs and morals, he begins putting the bite on drug dealers and homosexual <laughs> antique dealers. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Canceled. <laughs> it really says that. And homosexual <laughs> antique dealers to help clean things up. <laughs> that's a sign of the times they wouldn't uh, do that can't be real no it's real if, think about it in the 70s and the black community mm. to by today's standards they would probably say you know especially the the woke today would say that the black community is is homophobic is i've heard that a lot that the black community is more homophobic than the white community imagine in the 70s that's what yeah. that's how it would be characterized. So I can't imagine them doing a movie today where it's like, we want to have this anti-hero character, right? And we want him to be a guy who breaks the rules and you know, kind of like Dexter, where the serial killer who kills serial killers. So he's a vampire, right? And he's gonna kill the bad guys like drug dealers and gay antiques dealers. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically gay ones. That's what I mean. <laughs> Two surgeons <laughs> says based. It's a scourge. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, 
funny when I was watching Foxy Brown uh, at the very end when she confronts the, the white lady. Uh, she calls her boyfriend the uh, six letter F word. Oh yeah, she does. <laughs> she uses the she uses the F word twice. Yeah. And also uh, before that scene, like uh, middle of the movie, one of the characters goes to a lesbian bar, and then Foxy Brown comes to get her, and then they, she gets into a fight with a bunch of lesbians. <laughs> and so I was like, <laughs> wow, this is made of like seven <laughs> Yeah, I bet I bet there's probably if we looked it up, you know that game we were going to play like it, is this racist? We could probably play that game with any ism that the woke people talk about, but I bet you if you looked up like is is black exploitation homophobic, you'd probably find some college papers. <laughs> like yeah. like a lot of a lot of women's studies graduates writing stuff about how you know black exploitation is great because it empowers a black community except if it's just, just so bad that it's so homophobic <laughs> like, actually yeah, i did run into that because one of the articles i came across was like uh some thesis some um, some college person wrote uh about um the females in uh, black exploitation and how they weren't empowering and how it, it promoted stereotypes about lesbians um, cause I think, um, in, was it Cleopatra Jones, the, isn't there a lesbian, like the bad guy, like a lesbian or something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mama. Sure. Yeah. She has lots so, of yeah. voluptuous women hanging about. Yeah. So this person was going on about, you know, how it promoted the stereotypes and all that and that stuff. And I stopped reading. I was like, uh, I'm so sick. I'm just so sick of people just constantly viewing everything through the lens of race and gender. That's so annoying. Like the, the art of film criticism has just gone completely downhill. And that's all people view it through. It's just so annoying. It's, it's very tiring. Um, <laughs> I just saw <laughs> Alan Scott says they're making another Breaking Bad with gay antique dealers. <laughs> All gay antique dealers. He's going to need an assistant. <laughs> uh, I see what you did there. Okay. <laughs> okay. What else is fun that we can watch? Um, I had a clip from... Uh, I'm gonna get you sucker. I think we already played that. Uh, let's see. Or I have a I... Simpsons. We'll play Simpsons clip first. It's only like ten seconds. Yeah. Okay. I have to get past this ad. Here we go. Hmm. Yeah, this one's pretty pretty. They should give you like free ad block or like free premium. Yeah, you you should be allowed to play things that are on YouTube. I can't believe we got our video yanked for showing just like a clip of Whitney Houston singing at the at the uh, Super Bowl. They 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 copyright claimed that one. Yeah. So in our music episode, for anybody who doesn't know. When we had a special music night, like why did it was called Why Does Music Suck Now? And it was music through the decades. And we played clips. Mystery Chris and I and uh, Mark Owsley joined us that night, who's a doctor of music. And we played clips from every decade. And after the show air, we did a three hour show, which is our, that's our record. It was so much fun just going through the decades with you and listening to all the music. And then after the show aired, I think I got like 26 copyright claims, but all of them were the type that allow you to keep the clip up. You just can't monetize it, right? Of course. Uh, except for the Whitney Houston at the Super Bowl clip and Judy Garland, those two said, sorry, no, you can't even. So they took it off YouTube. If you want to see that episode, it was so much fun listening to music. That episode is on Rumble. But she's so singing a national anthem. I know. I, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Is the ad still playing? <laughs> Wait, what did you say? You playing? Are you? Well, it's not. We're not. We can't see it. If oh, you couldn't see it. That was just me watching it. <laughs> I was like, "What are you laughing?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Okay. 
I thought I had it up there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so stupid. Can you see it now? Yes. Next on Exploitation Theater, Blackula, followed by Blackenstein and the Blunch Black of Bloat Your Blame. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the blunt, the blunt, blunt black of bloater dame. Uh, maybe, maybe on the uh, uh, rap episode, we eventually we talk about rap. I uh, want to maybe if we can get away playing a clip from CB4. And there's this clip of this fake um, public enemy type rap group where it's just a black guy going, oh, I'm black, y'all, and I'm black, y'all, and I'm blickety black, and I'm black, y'all. It's just that over and over again. <laughs> we could try it okay you want me to pull up this hollywood shuffle clip um can it does have some language in it fair warning okay is this a what is this a surprise uh, no since hey, did you ever see the hollywood shuffle mm -hmm. this was just a uh scene from um this kind of fake acting school for the whole, for those who haven't seen Hollywood Shuffle, Robert Townsend made this movie in the '80s, and it's about a inspiring black actor who's struggling to get, you know, respectable roles, the only roles available uh, that he and most other blacks can get, or you know, pimps, drug dealers, and so the whole movie is kind of about his journey through through Hollywood. Okay, I think I have it. Oh, when you said Hollywood Shuffle, I thought you meant the Hollywood sh uh, Squares. I've seen the Hollywood Squares. <laughs> okay. I have seen the Hollywood Shuffle too, though. Okay, here we go. Can you can you see that? Yeah. Hi, my name is Robert Taylor, and I'm a black actor. I had to learn to play these slave parts, and now you can too at Hollywood's first black acting school. It teaches you everything. Learn jive talk one hundred and one. You motherfucking jack turkey motherfucker. All right, all right, that's good, that's good. You work, all right, you try it. You, you fucking mothers. Fucking no, 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 man, no, 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 that's wrong, that's wrong. Watch me, man. Just be cool. Jive turkey motherfucker. Go, 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 go. That's only the beginning. You too can learn to walk black. No, 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 no. No rhythm. Observe. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You too can be a black street hood. But this class is for dark skinned blacks only. Light skinned or yellow blacks don't make good crooks. <laughs> Here's a student in our dance class. I'm still at TV. It just happened to be under my coat. I don't know nothing, policewoman. Code Jack. Ironside. Yeah, I'm a gang leader. I'm in the warlords, the vice lords, the onion head. Let's talk to a graduate. This is Ricky Taylor. Ricky graduated from my class three years ago. Ricky, can you tell us what you've been doing since you've graduated? Well, Robert, I've played nine crooks, four gang leaders, two dope dealers. I played a rapist twice. Whoa. <laughs> that was fun. But currently, I, I'm filming a prison movie. I play this tough con that tries to fuck this new inmate. That sounds wonderful. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> Need I say any more? It's Hollywood's first black acting school. It teaches you everything. Classes are enrolling now. Learn to play TV pimps, movie muggers, street punks. Courses include Jive Talk 101, Shuffling 200, Epic Slaves 400, <laughs> Dial 1-800-555-COON. Oh, my goodness. Apologies for the language. <laughs> I want, I want this language. But yeah, uh, so that movie was also produced by uh, Keenan Ivory Waynes. He and Robert Townsend were really close buddies uh, coming up in the stand up world. And so Robert Townsend ended up, I think he financed the whole movie on his credit card to get like $25,000 of debt. Wow. That, that movie is actually the movie I've mentioned to you before that we produced with one of my, my comedy clients. It was called Thugs and Music. It was a short film, and that's why I have the pimp costume. And uh, uh, David Lyon Greer is in it. And we, we 
his inspiration, the comedian I worked with who wrote it, a lot of his inspiration was this film. And so there's, hmm. there are scenes in it that are exact, like an homage to Robert Townsend yeah. where they're going through like the stereotype. There's a scene where he's in line to audition, which used to happen to him a lot as a black actor. He was like, I would go in to play and he had a comedy routine about this. His name is Kevin Avery. He's really funny. Check out his stand up. He would talk about how he was going in to, to play a uh, thug number three, thug in a liquor store, number three. <laughs> <laughs> and he would be in line like with a top hat and a monocle he would say like well hello there hooligans and like the rest of the line was like actual thugs that he was auditioning against <laughs> <laughs> it was so silly anyway he put a lot of that into the movie some of the stuff from his stand-up but um there was you know a, uh, a stand-up routine by the guy who played ashley larry on Chappelle's show donald i keep forgetting his last name but uh stand up where you remember those kfc commercials with the sassy black lady in it kind of tell me more well, his, his joke would be like uh this woman was probably like a classically trained actress and like she'd go into to do the reading and she would go you are going to love my fried chicken and the producer would be like um could you uh you know make it a little bit more uh you know black <laughs> okay you gonna love my fried chicken honey <laughs> exactly. I'm like it's probably true. She probably is a great actress. But... <laughs> exactly. I I absolutely believe that. I absolutely believe that. Here's the here's the thing about um, as we critique woke culture, and I say we is I don't know everyone who does, not just us on this show, is you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like there were real criticisms about stereotypes and and different opportunities and roles and in in hollywood that it's true it was a boys club there were a lot of if you if you were a black actor you were going in for roles all the time like thug in liquor store number three <laughs> and so that's all true but then what's happened with wokeness as wokeness took hold is it's just the opposite extreme now it's like they're afraid to have a black person play a bad guy you know where it's it used to be like always the bad guy now like never the bad guy it just they just flip ever flip it neither yeah. of those things are reflective of reality if you're taking it to those two extremes and it's like they don't know how to they only know how to look at people and and write roles based on race and and with certain rules in their head or something right right and then see but then that's weird because like we hollywood went from you know the heavy emphasis on the more street gang pimps types for blacks you know in you know 70s 80s and stuff and now we've gone all the way to where like there's none like <laughs> you have struggled to find blacks playing like pimps or, or drug dealers they have to be like white or some race that you can't tell exactly what they are so it's just really interesting like a lot of people notice that about like the joke or no the batman movie like they had a gang that there wasn't a black person in the gang at all it was like hmm, no chance for that in the bed, but there's not a single black person in the gang. That's like the the new Resident Evil that we talked about that I liked a little bit more than you did, the series. In that series, though, I started noticing very early on in like the first first episode that every time new characters were introduced, it was like and never whenever, whenever there's like a new group of characters introduced, it's like, oh, the bad guys are all white and all the good guys are black. <laughs> like not for the whole series, but I just say like a lot of the background characters as you meet them, it seemed to be the case. Yes, yeah, it's has. Uh, can't wait for the day we can return to the old-fashioned stereotypes: blacks are pimps and <laughs> Muslims are terrorists. Be nice. Well, they really only knew how to do one extreme. So, <laughs> well, if we if 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 we ever defeat woke, they'll probably just go back to the old stuff, which is just <laughs> as bad. <laughs> In some ways, yeah. Okay. Um, I have Foxy Brown, and I have Coffee pulled up. The trailers, or is there a different different one that you want to watch? No, no. Go ahead and pull this up. Let's do Coffee because you said you like. Did you like that one better? Yeah, I like Coffee better than Foxy Brown. Okay. Do, do, do. I think Coffee was Pam Grier's first movie, I believe. 1973. And then she ended up doing like five of these. 
My name's Carter. I know where you are, too, and you're gonna get it. This is the end of your rotten life, you dope pusher! man send you to kill me? No. He didn't know nothing. Take her out and kill her. I think of all the fun I could have had with a good-looking stud like you. You really mean that? Yeah, showing the whole movie. <laughs> What'd you say? Yeah, they're showing the whole movie. Again, yeah, why are the trailers so bad? <laughs> I mean, they don't know how to just tease it. They give you everything. Um, I did see a chat go by. That's really funny. Uh, Twee Girl says, I love how she hides weapons in her hair. She does. There are some great scenes of Pam Greer pulling things out of her afro. There's one where she pulls a whole gun out of there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, Informagin says, actually, Pam Greer was in some earlier movies like The Big Dollhouse in 1971, but Coffee was her first starring role. Yeah. And several people in the chat are talking about how hot Pam Greer is. She was fine. <laughs> okay. Somebody wants to see, Kevin Anderson wants to see a black exploitation kung fu crossover. They had the Jim Kelly was in um, some of them. And there was the other ones. Yeah, that was a whole kind of subgenre of black exploitation. Was more kung fu because kung fu movies were very popular, obviously with the Bruce Lee movies. Okay, I've got a clip here that we can play. Let's see. It's got the ad on it, guys. I'm sorry. I got to wait. It's almost over. We're advertising for him. We need to add money. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Right. Change clothes. Oh. Let's go practice. Yeah. Oh. You learn defense before you attack. Hmm? Yeah, got it. Right on. Right. Have you ever heard of this one? I haven't heard of that one. So it's called Soul Brothers of Kung Fu in 1977. It has Bruce Lee in it. Uh, three working class immigrants become fast friends after bonding over their mutual love of martial arts. But when one of them becomes mixed up with a local mob boss, the other two have to save their friend. From the mob, the mob's evil clutches, or kill him trying. I like that they put voiceover on. It was completely unnecessary, but <laughs> yeah, they, they did a voiceover. I, were you a big fan of the kung fu films? A little bit. I wasn't like a huge fan, but I remember growing up watching Bruce Lee films. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an interesting melding of genres. I wasn't even aware. I haven't seen any of these. Did you ever see The Last Dragon? I don't think so. It's kind of a kung fu black exploitation film for the '80s, though. With uh, uh, Bruce Leroy is the main Bruce <laughs> character. Bruce Leroy. 
Yeah, uh, yeah this kid and grows up in Harlem, idolizing Bruce Lee, and he runs into this uh, gang led by the uh, self-proclaimed Shogun of Harlem called Shonuff. It's it's a campier film, but it's one of my favorite films. It's just so over the top ridiculous. No wonder you love it. It's it's campy. <laughs> I've seen, uh, there's a great movie called Finishing the Game. Have you heard of that? It's a, it's about, well, it's about how they, um, they well, they had to finish the movie The Game after Bruce Lee died. And they auditioned all these different actors to, to finish some of the, his scenes. And I believe the director is Justin Lin, who, let me look that up. Uh, no, Justin Trek movie and one of the Fast and Furious movies. Yes, Justin Lin. Yeah, he's known for Fast and Furious, but then he would make all of these other films that he really wanted to make on the side. And um, I believe he did Finishing the Game. Oh, you know, it'd be funny if he also did the other one I mentioned earlier. <laughs> if Oh, he did. He did Better Luck Tomorrow. Apparently, I just like this director. So, um, but Finishing the Game is great. I would definitely recommend it. Okay. I do have the Pam Greer one pulled up. Should we watch it or is it going to be the same? <laughs> Might as well watch a little bit of it. Okay. There we go. When Foxy Brown comes to town, all the brothers gather round. Cause she can really shake them down. Foxy lady, Foxy lady. Pam Greer, that one chick hit squad who creamed you as coffee, is back to do a job on the mob as Foxy Brown. You tell me who you want done, and I'll do the hell out of it. A chick with drive who don't take no jab. Crazy. No telling what you'll do. She's sweet brown sugar with a touch of spice. If you see a man in here, send him in because I do need a man. And murder if you don't treat her nice. Sounds like a public menace. Show do. Foxy's got guts. No ifs, ands, or buts. I better warn you, I got a black belt in karate. And I got my black belt in bar stool. <laughs> She won't budge when she carries a grudge. I want justice for all of them <laughs> whose lives are bought and sold <laughs> so that a few big shots can climb up on their back. Sister, I think what you're asking for is revenge. <laughs> so there ain't no hope for dudes who deal dope. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. This whole movie, I mean, this whole trailer is a haiku. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a couple of niggas. There's where she destroys his apartment. <laughs> that was the best part right there. Is here as Foxy. Yeah. She runs into that guy, chops him up. Uh, propellers. That, that was hilarious. That part. Should we pull up that clip? <laughs> you can buy it in. <laughs> but the whole uh, intro of Foxy. I was like copying James Bond. It was like straight up James Bond style movie. How much of these films do you think that that how how much of the influence do you think was um, the super spy who has all the cool like tools and weapons and you know is always the best fighter? How much of it had to do with the spy genre? No, I think it was heavily influenced by James Bond. You know. You can kind of see some of that influence in Shaft, and you know, especially like the end where he's doing very James Bond type rescue, and so yeah, I think it had a huge influence on on the genre. Mm -hmm. Were there any other clips that you wanted to play? Um, the only one is the "I'm gonna get you, sucker" one. Okay, I don't actually have that one queued up, so give me a second. Okay. Uh, if you want to read some chats while I do that, hold on one second. Okay, let's see. Let's go to the chat. To the chat. Shaft was a bad mother. Shut your mouth. <laughs> oh, yeah. Black Caesar was another one. I, 
I need to watch that. Have not seen that. You wanted uh, me to pull up the trailer, right? Uh, or what for? I'm gonna get you, sucker. Oh, no. I sent you. <coughs> I don't see one in there from you. I think that That's one was there? missing. No, I think that one was missing. Oh, uh, it should be in there. That should be in with it. It's in the says funny clip. Oh, funny clip. There we go. Okay, cool. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Okay. But this this is uh, in the setup. Uh, this is about a pimp who went to jail. Uh, one of the characters in the movies. Uh, pimp who went to jail for like 10 years. And then he gets released in the 80s. And so this is what happens. Wow. <laughs> that is an outfit. Yo, check out homeboy. See, Dominic's brother out there, huh? <laughs> Look at the fish in his shoes. <laughs> Girl, he must be a rock star. <laughs> Wow. The brother's walking on the aquarium. Hey, brother, do you get nose, please? Maybe it's his dinner. Say, brother, you been shopping at the Goodwill? The brother's an endangered species. <laughs> <laughs> I, love that. I haven't seen this movie are they just making fun of the genre yeah so Keenan Ivory Wayne's made I'm gonna get you sucker that's actually what got him the limit color gig from Fox but, <laughs> uh, like his O to uh, black exploitation films and there's actually some of the actors uh, Fred Williamson's in it uh, Isaac Hayes is in it. Uh, this guy, I don't know, I, I, I gotta look up his name, but he, of course, is in Foxy Brown and a bunch of other black exploitation films. That's yeah, funny. Kevin, Kevin Anderson says, just to remind people, the joke is that he's been in prison since the early 70s and not up to date on the latest fashions of the 80s. <laughs> 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 That's fantastic. That's a good, funny clip to go out on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, overall, would you recommend this genre? Uh, I do. I mean, in it's classic genre. And like one of the things I love about, you know, watching and kind of studying films is just kind of learning about the overall culture that the films came in, came out in, because a lot of times they kind of reflect what uh, was going on at the time and they influence things that are going on as well. And so uh, it's, it's, it's film history. And so um, a lot of fun. And like I said, I love Dolomite the best because those are pretty funny, but I think, you know, Chef and Coffee are pretty good. They're not like f funny, but I think those were uh, high quality films for the black exploitation genre. Do you think the woke would like black exploitation genre? It depends. It it it, it depends. It's it's like feminism. It's like some feminists will talk about how you know women showing their bodies and being you know very sexual and promiscuous is empowering. Other ones will be like you know women shouldn't be treated as sexual objects from the male gaze. So it's going to depend. There will be some that will see it as you know liberating, and other ones will see it as you know like the NAACP saw it back in the seventies as exploiting black people and putting out st stereotypes that harmed blacks. Mm -hmm. I think it's just. I think it's an entertaining genre, first of all, and good for a group of people like together to watch. And and then, like you said, it's a part it's a great part of cinema history. And it, it, it was influenced by a lot that came before and it. And it has influenced so much. That's what Kevin Anderson is saying. He's like, it's had real influence on what's come after. It's better than you would expect. So, yeah, anyway. Um, well, thank you guys for hanging out with us tonight. This has been a live episode of Popped Culture on Deep Program. And if you like the show, we ask that you consider sharing it or hitting like. It helps us, our algorithm, if you hit the like button. So if you're still here, please hit the like button. 
and we'll see you next week. Do you know what our topic is next week? Um, I think we're doing uh, Archie Bunker and Norman Lear. Oh, Archie Bunker. Okay, yeah. that sounds good. Um, tomorrow, I do have an announcement. I'm not putting out a deprogrammed interview tomorrow on Thursday. I've just had a lot to take care of before I head out of the country. And um, I, But I will have a Friday live show at the usual time, a live kerfuffy break. And then I'm doing a lot of pre-recorded interviews that I can release while I'm traveling. So we'll have some good conversations even while I'm on the road. If you happen to be in Switzerland, Amsterdam, or Germany, my husband is playing his bands there for the next couple of weeks. And I put on the community page a list of his dates if you want to go see him. I'll be there uh, the last week. So I hope I get to see. So if there's anyone listening in those places, I hope I get to see you. Okay. Anything you want to say? Uh, we're, well, what's a black, what's a black exploitation jive? <laughs> Stuart as I speak jive. <laughs> Stuart as I speak jive. That's good. Tiger. Yeah. Tiger him down, smack him, yuck him. Tiger speaks jive. <laughs> And Spanish. <laughs> Yo, home blood. Well, thank you guys. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Whoa. I was like, whoa. <laughs> Church time.